So today I'm going to talk a lot about cloud, a lot about security, but uh, the, the headline is about the open cybersecurity framework and how this works with the Amazon data lake. So hopefully at the end of this, you'll get a good idea of who I am, who Trellix is, uh, how we all work with Amazon and why this is good stuff. All right, so first off, uh, meet me and Trellix. Then we're going to look at security operations in the cloud, uh, the OCSF stuff, uh, how this fits together in the full picture, and then some specific examples to really bring this home. All right, so for me, I'm the cloud CTO at Trellix. Uh, my background actually comes from the public sector, uh, where I ran an incident response and a, a incident response team and a SOC there for most of a decade. So everything I'm talking about today is really from that perspective of being in the trenches there. Uh, I started uh, with uh, Mandiant and then FireEye and now Trellix about almost 10 years ago. And uh, we started by building out lots of things in the cloud. So if you kind of put those things together, it, it really tells you where I'm coming from, which is you know, deeply into the security end of things as a practitioner, but then also how you run cloud, how you build in cloud and how that all comes together. So I'm talking about Trellix, what is Trellix? So Trellix uh, is the combination of McAfee Enterprise and FireEye. I mentioned I came from the, the FireEye side, that's, that's my perspective on it, but we've all come together to do something that's different in security. And I love our core values, open, tenacious, curious, and fun. Uh, it's a great place to work. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, and I hope you can see that come through in our, our solutions here today. Uh, so I mentioned I, I used to run a SOC. So here is what cloud security looks like from the SOC perspective. You may get an alert from something like AWS Guard Duty, and this says, hey, this random instance is querying a domain name associated with a known command and control server. What the heck does that mean? Is this good? Is this bad? And really, you have two, two possibilities here. Either this is something like a false positive or nothing important, or something really, really bad has happened. It's really nothing in between. And that's kind of scary because you get a lot of these every day because uh, there's some specific questions you have to figure out. So when was this malicious? When was this domain declared malicious? As in, was it a long time ago? Maybe it's not malicious anymore. What kind of asset is this local IP? Uh, frequently, what you'll see on guard duty is that they will issue alerts for things that have ephemeral IP addresses, as in things that change around a lot. So if it's a, a container or maybe it's something like a, an AWS Lambda running, um, that might have borrowed an IP address that something previously had. And so this is not a big deal at all. But you don't know that until you go through all of these steps to figure out what this stuff looks like. And that's what we're talking about today. So getting answers, you have to figure out what kind of rule triggered this. So as a SOC analyst, you're trying to understand, OK, if this alert fired, what would that mean? What would have to go into firing that rule? Understand the artifact that would uh, go against that, the alert history. So all the different alerts that we've seen in the past is in how much do I trust this? How much do I trust that asset? And then what can I do about this? So let's say something really bad did happen. What are the possible actions that I can take? How do we remediate this? So all of this happens for every single alert in the SOC and this causes a big problem. Uh, that's why I'm so uh, impressed by the open cybersecurity framework coming in. And first off, there's a lot of different ways to say IP address. And analysts waste a ton of time figuring out through all of their different data how to line this stuff up. It could be any one of these different ways. And you can see just the spelling changes, all the different field names change. But if you say, hey, there was a malicious IP address, okay, I'm going to go make a query for that, or I'm going to write a rule for that, suddenly you're uh, presented with this challenge as in, well, when you say IP address and you say bad IP address, how would you even go about labeling that? And so this is what OCSF is really trying to, to solve. It's the inefficiency of this mismatched security data. And I, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, I've been in security for almost 20 years now, and I've never seen uh, this many companies come together to try to solve this problem. This has been a problem since I started. And just to give you an idea of how cool this is. So I'm in a Slack channel with a whole bunch of other people and other security companies. So uh, Amazon and a lot of other major players and some of them are our competitors. And we have all come together in this chat channel to figure out and have these meetings to figure out what we want to call this stuff. It's really exciting to see us all come together and make things better for our customers in general. We've all agreed that this needs to stop now, that we need to label things the same so that when you put it all together, it will make sense. 
Uh, so I just outlined all the different things that analysts currently have to go through. But with OCSF, everything will be named the same thing. So an IP address is always known to be labeled the same thing in the same context. So if you want to say, I want to find all the bad things that happened from an endpoint, you know that you can query from an endpoint's IP address and it will always be the same thing. So whenever you're writing rules, whenever you're trying to line things up, all of that happens in the same way. And this means that when you put all the data in the same place, it actually adds value instead of becoming this giant operational burden and yet another challenge to go through. This is where the security lake comes in. So everything that goes into security lake is in the OCSF schema in that format. And that means that anytime you're working with data in the Amazon security lake, you can expect it to be labeled correctly in the way that you assume. And this has been such a huge part of all of the security big data problems we've had in the industry over the, the last almost 10 years. Uh, so much of the machine learning and AI that goes into it, all that work is really this unexciting cleaning of data and trying to get it all to line up. And so we're trying to remove that big challenge by saying, we're gonna put it all in the same way at the same time. So we know that everything in Security Lake is labeled correctly and we can just use it. We don't have to worry about, oh, is this query actually gonna query what I want? Because if you're a practitioner and you say, well, I ran a query and I didn't get any results, that could mean either you, the query wasn't right or there weren't anything, nothing bad happened. And that's a, a really big distinction to make. You have to be very sure when you're running queries that you're going to find what you were looking for because a negative result is, is very uh, telling. So by putting all the stuff into security like in these commonly used formats, uh, for instance, everything in there right now is just as Apache Parquet, which is a standard format. It's on S3. And so you can really do anything you want with that data. There are specific APIs you can use uh, with Security Lake to do uh, queries that way. But you can also take your favorite indexing. You can do it. You can run Athena on it. Uh, you could put it in Snowflake. You could put it in OpenSearch. You could put it in anything that you want. It's really up to you and how much time you want to spend on the indexing of it and the querying, or you can query it in place with something like S3 Select. And so the fact that it is in such a common format like this with all the options that everyone has already learned how to use is really what makes this so impressive that now we have the data in an expected way in an expected place. And suddenly uh, we have a great ecosystem building here. So what does this look like from the Trellix perspective? So we have something called Helix, which reads in all this data. And the way this looks today is that we can take all the data that goes into Security Lake and uh, the Security Lake team will be adding on uh, all the different Amazon sourced data as time goes on. There's also other vendors that are putting data into Security Lake. Uh, we at Trellix will be doing that as well as time progresses. Uh, Security Lake is currently in public preview and will be GA in midpoint next year. And so as all these things come into Security Lake, we can read them into Helix today and in, in next year we'll be able to query it as well. So what this looks like from our perspective is that now you can add in all of the telemetry we're getting on the Amazon side, plus all the telemetry that we have on our side. And finally, we can make all the, uh, the correlations that you need to detect some of the more advanced stuff. I'll outline exactly what that looks like. And one of the key things to all this is just how easy it is to get going. It's basically a click and then you put in the name of the bucket where your security lake is and you're done. Uh, we generate the templates. It all goes through CloudFormation, all the normal things that you would expect. And so it really just takes seconds uh, completely you know, through the normal audit channels. Uh, you have rollback, all the things that you would associate with uh, proper operations. Uh, very easy to do. So um, easy to get started with. So what does this look like when we start adding in with all the other things that we do? So uh, at Trellix, we have over 100 different connectors for Helix. And this allows us to bring in a whole lot of other areas, which become really important. I'm going to out outline that for you right now. So identity, uh, a huge part of all this. It doesn't matter where you're getting your identity from. It becomes a big deal. So I have that little crown circled there. One of the cool things that we do on Helix is based on the labeling for whichever directory you're using, we can figure out if this is a, a quote unquote VIP or someone that we need to pay special close attention for targeted phishing attacks or other targeted attacks that may be going against that identity itself. And then we can mix in all the other things. So we have great partnerships with places like Okta, uh, uh, pull in all of the, the details there. And then some of the MFA stuff, which becomes really important. I'll show you an example in a minute here, but just knowing if someone used an MFA token to log in can be very helpful because if they didn't, that can be a uh, cause for alarm and someone wants to dig into that further. 
And then this is where I think things get especially interesting. So you mix in all the cloud stuff I talked about, all the identity stuff. And now what about the business apps? Things like Salesforce logins, all the O365 stuff going on, team viewer events, uh, events happening in Slack and Teams. All this stuff comes into one place so that you can make sense of what's going on and get an idea of what a user has been doing if there is an alert associated with them. And then on the storage side, we integrate, of course, with Amazon S3 as well as others being able to not only detect malicious files, but this is where things get cool. We are uh, in, in the FireEye side, we are known as a sandbox, sandbox company. We run the file, tell you what it would have done if that file were executed. And so we could say, you can go and look for something like this domain name or this IP address, which is now easier with OCSF, and be able to find out if this file ever executed in your environment based on the sandbox output. And all that can go into Helix. You can match that up very easily and write rules for it. On the email side, we integrate with pretty much everybody. Uh, we have a great email product ourselves. If you're using someone else, fine. Uh, it all goes in and that's where you can start pulling things out uh, to figure out if there was a phishing attack, what that would look like. I'll show you an example of that in just a second. And on the endpoint side, critical piece here, we integrate with pretty much every endpoint out there. Uh, there's maybe a few that we don't, but you know, competitors or not, uh, if you have the data, we will help you make sense out of it. And so this is where the, the magic happens. If you're a hardcore analyst, you can put this stuff in and start doing some, you know, slicing and dicing the data, you get some intersections, you can write rules on all of this. But the fact that you have all this information at your fingertips is really what makes it so interesting and so powerful. So putting this all together in a few example use cases here. Uh, so let's look at an example scenario for phishing. So we still see probably 90% plus today of attacks start with credentials stolen via phishing. It still works, uh, especially in targeted attacks. It's very difficult to fend those off if someone's really trying. And so we see this uh, time and again, especially in cloud security, uh, where someone's going to come into your environment, they probably are doing it with stolen credentials. And if they have stolen credentials, it's usually from phishing. So how do you know, first of all, phishing is happening? And secondly, if uh, someone is actually inside your environment with those stolen credentials, this comes back to basically an audit trail of everything that's going on in your environment. So I talked about Duo and having that MFA uh, audit trail coming in. There's the Amazon IAM side. And those uh, logs all come into Helix itself, along with something like our email product, which can point out some of the phishing. So the, the question is, all right, we have all the logins that have occurred next to all the phishing that's occurred. And now we can tell if there was a phishing attack, whether or not someone logged in right after that and where they came from, because perhaps that is anomalous. So we will fire an alert if that happens. And if that did happen, you can use our orchestration to then go and disable the account on the Amazon side. And then the other part of this, I think it's forgotten quite a bit, and this goes back to my practitioner days, is scoping this. So if there is a malicious link that happened, how many people clicked the link and how many didn't? And what I typically have seen is attackers will change the domain name, but not the rest of the link. And so you can say, all right, well, we know that this was bad. So we'll, we'll look at just the, the second part of the URL, everything after the slash and do searches on that to see if there were other similar attacks that came through. And sometimes you find out that there has been a, a campaign going on for weeks and you have other people clicking on that. That happens actually fairly frequently. And you would never know if you didn't have this information in one place. So a second example here, how about just the basic I am account compromise? What does this look like? So let's say it came in through endpoint. So we get an endpoint alert. We match that up with something like a guard duty finding. Uh, all those things get correlated. And now we have an alarm that we can react to. And you can use something like Trux Cloud Advisory to go in and actually quarantine that specific workload. What's interesting on the Cloud Advisory side, uh, that's one of our products on cloud security, is that you can actually use the native firewall within Amazon to do that uh, quarantining. You don't even have to have an agent running on that endpoint, or perhaps it's a load balancer that can't run an endpoint agent at all. And if that's the case, you can still quarantine it by essentially writing a deny all rule uh, on the uh, native cloud firewall. All right, so with that, I'll see if there's any questions that have come in here.